Sorry about that. Oh, dude, are you all right, bro? Yeah, nah, it was, it's, a, I, it's like two things. My friend's fucking paralyzed, and then this other dude I know passed away. So I, everybody's, you know, Jesse Mallon, the guy that was in, uh, I've known him since he was a fucking kid, is like paralyzed right now. Oh, and uh, yeah, just, I, I, I was like dealing with all that shit, but sorry about that. No, dude, do you need to reschedule? Like, that's more important. Nah, I'm good, dude. I'm, I, listen, when my brother Frank died, I fucking was on my computer three hours later, fucking working on my addiction book. So that's what I that's what I do, you know. That's how you roll, so, man. Yeah, no problem. Well, sorry, dude, I'm late. No, don't don't even don't even, man. It's all good, bro. Look, listen. I, first of all, I wanted to thank you. I've been uh, following you for a number of years, and uh, in 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 leading up to this, I've listened to tons of your tons more of your material that I already have listened to. And I, I heard something that you said that kind of stuck with me that I wanted to start with. You were talking about how important it is to like hang out with people, have bros and friends that, that hold you accountable. And I think that even though this is our first time connecting on social media, I would say that you're one of the people that, that do that for me. And I just wanted to thank you. And I always love how like authentic you come across, how un- unafraid you are to kind of confront people with different views. And uh, yeah. I think you do it in, in a, uh, Mostly intelligent and classy ways. That's pretty cool, man. I appreciate you being here. Mostly. Sometimes. Mostly. Even I act, everybody acts the fool. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't. And I, and I said that, you know, the other day, because I'm writing this book on addiction. And, um, I, you know, the press, when my memoir came out and everything else, and then they were like, oh, would you change? You know, if you could go back and change anything, like, would you? And I said, absolutely not, because all of those events that took place, all the pain, all the suffering, the good times, the bad times, all of it shapes our character so that we become who we are. I said, the one thing that I would probably do different was the way I reacted to those events in certain ways. It wasn't always the best. It wasn't always the best way. I didn't always react the best way I could have, which... You know, I'm turning 61 in, in, in a little bit this year, so fucking uh, if I can get anything out of uh, getting older, a little bit of wisdom, don't, you know, sit back, take everything in, and then, you know, uh, just, you know, rea- don't, don't, don't uh, instant react to something, like sit back and, and, uh, work out the best way to, to deal with something tactfully, you know? So, uh, yeah, man, um, a lot of shit going down and, uh, uh, just staying on the path, man, you know, that's, that's what, that's what I've been doing. And, um, working on this book, like I said, you know, I lost my, my brother dealt with addiction. I dealt with addiction, my whole family, my fucking grandparents from Ireland, the whole shit. It's just been running in the family. And I've been dealing with my brother's addiction. I, I had to do an, he almost died right before nine 11. I had to do an intervention on him. This has been going on for fucking 25 years now. And, um, I lost him at the end of 2022. And, you know, the way I dealt with it was, Right in the middle of writing a book on addiction, he dies. So the way I dealt with it is I put that energy, you know, all of those emotions. I was on my, I got the call and I live in Florida and this happened up in New York. So there was nothing I could do. I couldn't get on a fucking plane right then and there. It was, so I did what I do. I put, I I got on my computer and, and, and went and started a whole new chapter. And I said, this is the chapter I never wanted to have to write. Yeah. Because I, the chapter before it, I said, I had to show him tough love and say, listen, when you're ready, you know, to, to get help and, you know, you have my number, give me the call. And the next chapter was that chapter. And I opened it with, unfortunately, it's the call I'm never going to get. Three hours ago, I received the message that my brother had died from his addiction. And the rawness of that chapter, it's, you know, it's just like when I wrote Evolution of a Cro-Magnon, I was like having to confront all the shit that was done to me as a kid. And like, it was, I would have fucking emotional breakdowns at the computer, just 
lose my shit and stop writing and 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 had to put the had to put the book down and it was you know my my writing teacher that was like it's not what happens to us it's what we do as a result of it so that's that's you know as a result of hearing my fucking baby brother just fucking died that we've been through all this shit together like how did i deal with it what did i do did I go fucking grab a bottle of alcohol and fucking dr drink myself and relapse? No. I doubled down. I got on my computer. I wrote one of the most powerful, emotional fucking chapters of the book. I fucking went and I did a fucking bike ride the next fucking day, 30 fucking miles, tears in my eyes. I got in the pool crying behind my goggles, but never once... Was I like, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to go fucking get fucked up. It's what we do as a result of the events that happen. And that's why I said, if I could change anything, it would be, you know, some of the ways I, I, I dealt with shit over the years, man. What is your, what is your outlook on addiction? I asked that because I have a lot, we all have a lot of friends or addicts. And I think some people that I've spoken to are very set in believing that it's a chemical situation. Some people I've spoken to, and I'm asking this also for me because I, I've never been like like an addict, like an air quotes, but I've had I've I've dealt with like uh, obsession, obsessive compulsiveness when I was younger. My mom's you know bipolar mom, depressed, in and out of hospitals, overdosing on things, and uh, I feel like a lot of my life has been trying to understand it and also trying to overcome it. And like for me, I think that I've. I just at some point realized like my brain obsesses. That's just what I do. My brain is very like laser focused. Yeah. And, and if you point at that laser focusedness on horrible things, you're going to fucking get in a loop. And I'm like wondering for you and for people you're dealing with. And as you're writing the book, like how much of it is like a chemical thing and how much of it is just like uh, an emotional, spiritual thing of being a, uh, leaning right. on, a, so, on a chemical crutch. You know, there's been tons of studies on the whole thing. I mean, if and what I found by talking to because I, I researched the fuck out of shit for this book. It's just this is not just like just like I did with Meanies for Pussies or the PMA effect or you know, um any of the books I, I wrote. It's unfuck your health, did the research. So I did the research for this too. So there are people who are predisposed to some chemical imbalance in their brain. So when they take to addiction, right? The addiction itself is not the chemical imbalance. You know, there is addiction issues that can run in cycles through families. But, you know, um, the, the stuff that I've researched and, and what I've, uh, it, becomes, it, it becomes like adding a, a fucking match to gasoline, right? Mm. So there's already an issue there, right? So then... You, you, you self-medicate and then you get people that first of all they start taking these fucking psychotropic fucking drugs which i tell everybody read a book it's called confessions of an rx drug pusher by gwen olson amazing book her niece was on all these psychotropic drugs which she had problems it made the problems a hundred times worse totally OK, how do you take a medication if you're depressed that gives you suicidal thoughts? Her niece set herself on fire and killed herself. So then she went on the war path because she was a pharmaceutical representative and she outed the whole shit. That 95 percent of these kids and these people that are on these drugs do not need to be on these drugs. These drugs are drugs and that are given to people so that they can make fucking money. OK, I had issues all my whole life. Right. Fucking this, that, the other thing. But guess what? I didn't I self-medicated, but I never went on a single one of these fucking medications for any of this shit. And it was suggested when I was locked up as a kid. I came off the fucking streets, people trying to murder me. I was violent as fuck in the institutions. They had me see a psychiatrist and put me on fucking Thorazine at first. And I've said, fuck this. I feel like a fucking zombie. Like, you know, that's what they do to these kids. Even my nephew was in um, 
my nephew was in, and, and I was signed on as at his guardian, my brother that died's kid, because he was a fuck up and his kid was in a group home and I became like his guardian kind of had to sign him out for. So he, he, he told me that um, they were experimenting on the kids in Salvation Army group home. Right. Dig this. This is fucking you're hearing it from the fucking horse's mouth. They they experimented just like Fauci did with the AIDS drugs mm. in the 80s. Spin article came out, everything. What did he do? He went to orphanages and shit where these kids didn't have no fucking parents. And he fucking used them as guinea pigs for AIDS drugs. And a lot of them died and had medical conditions. So they've been doing this for a while. Right. So the Salvation Army. My nephew told me because they broke into the they broke into the file room one night and they were reading all the kids files and shit. And he goes to me, yo, Uncle John. I said, Frank, why do why do I see these kids and they're normal kids and we're going out and fucking playing ball. And then all of a sudden, when I come back later or whatever, they're all fucking zombies laying around. He's like, yo, they, they, they have these kids on all these test medications and Salvation Army is getting whatever, say 30,000 a year care for these children that are in this group home. If they can, if they put them on drugs, the pharmaceutical companies were paying Salvation Army $100,000 plus a year for the care of these kids so that they can use them as guinea pigs. Well, what happened to these kids? Three of them broke out at night. They had to start locking the doors down. Three of them broke in at night, out at night, and raped and murdered a woman on the block. I know those kids that did that. That was way something they would have never done. They were the nicest fucking kids before those medications came along. So my point is this. You know, the, the, even the, even if you want to say it's hereditary, there's a gene. They always say, oh, they got the gene, you know, the fucking Irish, whatever the fuck. So when I was writing this book and all this stuff was going down, I get this message on Instagram and it's it's this woman. She's like, I'm your cousin. You've never met me. Your father... And my father were brothers. I live in Long Island, in Long Beach, Long Island. Uh, I was on, literally, I had all my bike clothes on because that's where I would go to train. I would ride from, it was like one of my lighter, you know, it was like 30 miles out there, 30 miles back to the city. I'm like, I'm riding to fucking Long Beach right today, right now. I'm about to leave. I'd love to meet you. Mm. So she told me the whole shit and I put it in the book. When my my cirrhosis of the liver, grandfather dying at fucking 30, at 50 years old, 46 years old on, on my Irish, on that side of the family. She said that when your father and my father were young enough to reach their hand up to the bar, they were served hard liquor. So to me, I look at it this way. It's the lifestyle and the surroundings of people that make addicts, Right. Like, even for me, I was I was dealing with a lot of emotional shit coming out of the foster homes and all the rest of the shit, the shit that happened to me. So I self-medicated. But the fact that I was around people on the streets of New York in 76 and 77 and 78 that were complete psycho psychopaths doing fucking drugs and got involved in the drug shit, that, that was adding fuel to the fire. So... When you, even in, 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 in uh, Vedic philosophy, it says that you take on the qualities of the people that you associate with. So that's why even in the program, they tell you people, places, and things, you know, mm -hmm. don't, uh, you know, don't go back to these individuals you got high with. Don't go to those places where you got high. Don't do the things you did. That led to you getting high. You got to break that cycle. And that's like the final message of this book was that I was able to break the cycle of addiction that exists in my family. And I did it by my way, which is 
I, I got to my higher power. To me, I believe in God. I, I was a monk, Hare Krishna monk. I make no uh, bones about it. As a matter of fact, always within reach, Srimad Bhagavatam, the spotless Purana from India, part of the Vedas. Um, it's exercise. That's my higher power too. It's going out into nature. It's it's ex it's it's eating a clean diet. It's all of that stuff is what gives us that higher. And Prabhupada always said that. Who who brought it from India? He said we cannot give up the lower taste of all these things that people are attracted to in this material world, particularly intoxication. If we don't receive a higher pleasure. Then we're able to give up. You know, if you have a million dollars, if someone says, here's a million dollars and here's a thousand dollars, which one do you want? Which one are you going to take? Yeah. You're going to take the million dollars because the thousand dollars is already included in the million dollars. And he used that analogy to say, like, hey, like, go for the higher taste in life because that satisfies beyond everything else. It's like getting that million dollar pay payday. And that's that's the whole thing. And that's that's the way I choose to deal with it. I mean, I've been writing this book now for closing in on three years and I'm finally like down to the last couple of sections. Um, and I'm also utilizing my coaching business because I coach in one aspect and that's discipline, mm. because I don't give a fuck whatever else you do in this life. If you don't have discipline in your life, everything you do will eventually Go to shit because discipline is what creates the habits, the routines and everything else that when the pressure's on, we don't fold. It's not about how we feel. I don't feel I don't. That's why motivation's bullshit, because it waxes and wanes. Right. Mm -hmm. One day you feel so motivated and fired up. Then you don't want to do shit. Guess what? The disciplined person, when he doesn't want to do shit, he goes and does it. Yes. He gets after it and he does it with more determination than before because he knows he's being he or she is being tested. And that's where discipline kicks in. It's not, you know, discipline is um, you know, it, it's not about feelings or you know how I feel. It's it, it it's 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 mood follows action, right? Mm -hmm. Not the other way around. If it, you know. It starts with the action. And then, you know, slowly, many times I didn't want to go for the run or the bike ride or whatever. And then, like, when the sweat starts coming, I'm like, holy shit, I can't believe that I didn't want to do this, you know. And now look how great I feel after after I trained or, you know, or got up early and meditated and all this stuff that I do at this point to maintain my sobriety. But I'm like, why is this whole... Why is addiction spinning out of control? Why are why are more and more people addicted? And if we look at it materially, if we look at things spiritually, which we should, we've never been more materialistic in the history of this fucking planet. There's every gadget, there's every channel, there's everything we fucking want. We fucking go online and call Amazon and the next morning the shit's at our fucking door. How fucking convenient. But the more materialistic a society becomes, the more miserable they become, the more unhappy they become, the more they have to look for intoxication and drugs to try to fill that fucking that void that's existing in their heart. Because Prabhupada also said, if you have a bird in a cage and all you ever do is decorate the cage, meaning all, all you ever do is shit for your body and your senses and all this shit. You're leaving the real essence of who we are unhappy. You're always going to feel like something's missing. Yeah. It's only when we satisfy the whole of who we are, and that's a spiritual search, and that's not religious. That, that, that has nothing to do with dogma. You know, whenever people hear religion, it's like it's dogma because religion without philosophy is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is dogma. And philosophy without devotion is mental speculation. You're fucking just speculating all over the place. There's two ways of receiving knowledge in this world, the ascending process and the descending process. You could, you could travel at the speed of mind for millions of lifetimes and never understand anything about the absolute truth. But let's hear from self-realized people 
and take up the path. That's what that's what it and that's what it all boils down to with anything. It's a science, right? They always say trust the science. I trust the science. I have a formula, I apply it, I get a result, right? So what's the formula? Do these things in your life and you won't need drugs or alcohol. You'll be happy, you'll be healthy. Right? Yeah. There you go. You apply the formula. You don't say, well, you know what? I'm going to get fucked up on Friday nights. That's going to, I'm going to break the formula. No, then you're not going to get the desired result. You're always going to have problems. Issues are always going to come up. So to me, and I'm interviewing three different people in the book who have over 20 years uh, clean and sober, um, you know, friends of mine, very well-known people. And this, and I say to them, what is, if you could give one piece of advice to somebody struggling right now, what would it be? And, you know, it's, I want to hear from people who are successful. We don't want to hear from, you know, I, although people that are failing constantly, there are lessons to be learned in those failures of them, even in myself, my failures trying to get off drugs. I have to analyze that and be like, how did I fail? What? You know, what was it that caused the relapse that, you know, and, and I got 22 fucking years in now. And before that, when I came, I, I mean, I spun out so hard on addiction in 88 when the cro broke up, when I left the band, that I went out of control. I was fucking freebasing pills. My first time freebasing the guy that stole, he stole fucking whatever, a, a quarter, a half a key from the Cuban cartel in Miami. The motherfucker showed up with AR-15s two days after where I'm sitting there freebasing and emptied two magazines into the fucking house, into the room where I was sleeping. Jesus. That was my experience from day one with freebasing, and it only got crazier from that point on. Motherfuckers are not going to believe the shit that I went through. It, and it all revolved around drug and alcohol use to the point where I t I grabbed the fucking Colombian on 18th and 8th Avenue, put him in my car, beat the fucking shit out of him, threw him out at 50 miles an hour. I had KOSs on my head, kill on sight from fucking drug dealers that I was robbing. Like, I was a fucking maniac. And then I went on this tear on the West Coast because I had to leave New York. I had... Three fucking four drug gangs fucking looking to kill me. They were they were like, we're gonna kill that fucking white boy surfer looking motherfucker when we catch him. Cause Jesus. you know, it, 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 and and it was like, what did it take? It even after I had a near death experience so many times, and then at the end of the whole shit, after two years of spinning out of control, and the story's fucking crazy. I came back. And I was with this like Hollywood executive's fucking daughter. And we went through fucking like almost 200 grand of their money in a matter of a fucking year. And like they had the fucking feds looking for me. Fucking I had robbed the Chili Peppers uh, fucking merch person. We stayed with her. We robbed all her money. And she had um, Crystal Speed. We robbed her. They, the scene was looking for me. Everybody. And then I get on this plane and we sold her car for two ounces of fucking blow, uh, two plane tickets and a thousand bucks and get on the plane. And like, she knew she was terrified of me. She was like, she called her friend and told her what, what flight we were on. And this was after they were looking for us for a year. This motherfucker, her father did the inaugural ceremony for Ronald Reagan, okay? That's how motherfucking powerful these people were. Jesus. And... Man. How, how does that make I you... Got, how does you that... Know, and, and then what happened was the feds were waiting there at JFK, and I got away. Which I tell how I got away. You never fucking believe it. How'd you and, get away? Huh? How'd you get away? So... First of all, she was crying on the plane. I said, yo, what the fuck? She's like, you scare me. You're going to kill somebody or get us killed or, 
I said, yo, what the fuck are you talking about? So I had checked one ounce into the baggage, into the baggage. Back then, they didn't do all this shit. This is like 80, 80, 80, 89, right? They didn't do all this, like, you know, um, you know, fucking screening and patting you down and all this shit. They didn't even check your bag. I had an ounce. One of the ounces was in my carry-on bag. And then the other ounce I checked into the plane. Right to the okay. luggage. So in the so like she starts acting fucking weird on the flight, and then I'm like, "Yo, what's up?" You know, because I was like, "Oh, we're gonna get clean. We're gonna get clean." I got two ounces of fucking blow. Like, but I said, you know, because we sold the car to a drug dealer. We said, "Oh, we'll sell the blow, whatever." The minute she she goes, "I'm scared." I said, "What did you do?" I noticed she was on the phone, and she said that she just called the drug dealer that gave us the tickets to tell him that we made the flight. It was her friend. And then it comes out, she told her friend, this girl Nadine, who was the next door neighbor where they lived on Pacific Coast Highway in Santa Monica. She's the heiress to the post serial fucking, you know, and she fucking told him. So I was like, you fucking... I can't believe you fucking did that to me. Because I was wanted by the military. I had federal warrants. I was AWOL since 1980. I said, I'm going to go to fucking... And I, I I skipped out on a drug charge. I was smuggling in the military. It's a crazy story. Oh, my God. It's like a fucking then, movie, I'm dude. Like, You're going to go to a fucking rehab in fucking Malibu, and I'm going to fucking prison. And... The first thing, next thing out of my mouth was, we have to sniff all the blow in the overhead. And I started running <laughs> to the bathroom, fucking doing boulders. I'm sweating. I'm picking up the Bhagavad Gita like, all of you people are going to be animals in your next life and be brutally murdered. You're eating animals. Your karma. I'm fucking screaming. The fucking stewardess is like, sir, take your seat. And fucking dude, it was like from all the way, like two hours into the flight, all the way to landing for the next four hours. I had fucking coke. It's like a movie. I had coke all over my face and like fucking. uh, So the way I got away was I said, this is what's going to happen. You're going to walk off the jetway before me into the terminal so that they're going to grab you. When they do that, I'm going to fucking... I'm going to merge into the other passengers and hit that fucking when you get off in JFK. So what happened was I put a baseball hat, my fucking sunglasses, and she got off. And quickly, I didn't wait till all the people, because then they would have been like, where is he? I waited. So she was like here. And there was a family, maybe two, one group behind her. So when we got down the jetway into the terminal, as soon it was rain, piss raining. As soon as we get into the terminal, fucking suits. We, we got to just fucking converge. I merged in with this family of kids and everything and went down the escalators. And they're like, where is he? Who's got a fucking whatever on him? So this is how I got away. Never in a million years did they think this motherfucker's going to pick up his luggage, right? Yeah. I was like, I got an ounce of blow in that fucking suitcase. The junkie in me was just like, I'm not leaving that. So I go downstairs by the carousel, and I'm fucking hiding behind a column, waiting for the bags to come off. And this fucking dude is over there with like, I don't know, Metallica or Anthrax fucking shirt on. And this this like 20-something year old metal kid. And I'm like, psst, psst. and he's got his walkman. So I hit him in the face with a quarter. And he's like, it's like, yo. And he's like, he's looking at me and he's like, I saw you at the Beacon Theater open up for anthrax, man. Fomags. I'm like, yo, shut the fuck up. Here's my fucking luggage ticket. Go get my fucking bag. I got the cops after me. And back then at JFK, they had the shit was secure you couldn't get out with somebody's luggage the way you can now yeah. you had to show the ticket and they actually checked the bag against the ticket never in a million years did the cops think this motherfucker's lottie die gonna go get his fucking luggage but i did so when i got my luggage and i went outside 
they was already back in the terminal because they immediately went out to the street to see if I was there trying to get in a cab. So I was inside, they were outside. So like when I went to get in the cab and I got in the cab and would start to pull away, I saw all the feds and the detectives come out and fucking be like, looking for me, but I was gone. So we had made a plan that there was, there was the Coke bar I hung out called the Alcatraz on Avenue A and A street. And I said, call me there. Uh, you know, cause you know, I know you're getting grabbed, whatever happens, just call me at the Alcatraz. So I'm sitting there and I'm fucking doing the blow. Right. And then, um, the, I get a call and the bartender is like, John, it's for you. And I was like, Kate, where the fuck are you? And I hear this, it's not Kate. This is her father. And he goes, you're good, John. You're very good, John McGowan. He knew my last name, which I never used. I was like, fuck. He's like, here's the deal. You stay away from our daughter, this goes away. If you try to contact her at all, you're going to prison for a very long time. And I was like, but I love her, man. Click. <laughs> Holy crap. I go to this crack house, crack apartment, because back then they had these apartments, right? People that were cracked out. And you could go there and cook your shit up or smoke your crack. And, you know, you hook the person up whose apartment it is. You give them some rocks or whatever, and you could sit there and get high. So I went over there with the two ounces and my shit and the money. And I fucking, you know, I, I, I cooked up some rocks. That's free bases. You just take baking soda and you, you boil the Coke with the baking soda. It separates the impurities. It turns into a jelly. Then you freeze that jelly and that turns into rock. And that's what you smoke. So I was smoking in this apartment and then... Motherfuckers hit me with a two by four on the back of my fucking skull, split my head open, took my money, took all my blow, everything. I woke up. I was like, yo, what the fuck? And they dragged me out into the hallway and just fucking left me there. So I went into Tompkins Square Park. I had burned every bridge. It was pouring rain. I just sat in the rain with my head fucking bleeding. And I just... Went right where Prabhupada, there's a sacred tree in Tonka Square Park when Prabhupada first came from India in 67, 66. And he would chant there. And I went there and I just did, I just chanted. And I went to the temple the next day and I said, if I don't, if you don't let me move in here, I'm going to be dead. So they let me move in and I talk about it. But what happened was when I, I I beat that and I stayed clean, but then I started dabbling again, you know, in the fucking 90s. I got, you know, I was with this model girl. We're going on Jamaica and everything else. I'm taking mushrooms. I'm going to the clubs. I'm taking ecstasy. I never did coke or anything like that, but I was drinking and smoking a shitload of weed, eating mushrooms, eating fucking, you know, cakes and all this shit to get high, like a fucking piece of shit. You know, mm. and then like I would take, you know, a fucking uh, a, a Percocet to come down, whatever. I'm like, I am going right back into the same path. So right before 9-11, I had to do the intervention on Frank and all this other shit happened. I got caught with my weed delivery service. All of this shit started happening. And I was like, that's it. This is all drug related. All the misery in my life right now is drug and alcohol related. And I got fucking clean right from there. Right before 9-11 and then 9-11 happened. My brother got stuck on my couch. I had to go to Staten Island. My, this lady called me. She's like, your brother's living in my attic. You need to come and get him or he's going to die. He was unrecognizable. I picked him up September 10th, 2001. Bring him on the ferry looking at the fucking World Trade Center. My brother says, you want to go to World Trade Center? I was like, no, we're going to my apartment, dude. This is no lunch in top of the fucking world shit, whatever the fuck, you know, that people will go there and eat. And I was like, we're going to my house. 
Next morning, turn on the TV. I'm going for a bike ride. I had him going out to a rehab later that day in St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands. These friends of mine, the Morrisons, who were some fucking tough Irish motherfuckers on the Lower East Side, opened up their brother, um, Joey, opened up a, a rehab in in uh, in St. Thomas. So they were going to take care of Frank, all this shit. And uh, next day, the planes fucking hit. Couldn't get him out for a month. Mm. Dude was detoxing on my couch, crying. I'm reliving all of the shit that he and all of us had to go through. It was it was the craziest shit ever. And 9-11, yeah. smelling the burning bodies, the ash fucking. Imagine, like, dealing with your loved little brother and, and, and all the trauma that happened to us in the middle of 9-11. And I had... And I'll just end this here and then we can move on. But I I, I want to finish this story because um, at simultaneously, right before 9-11, um, my mother was married to somebody. Like when we were in the foster home, she had a boyfriend named Carl that didn't want us around. So she left us in the foster home being abused because he did not want us around. We were cock blocking you know, he fucking didn't like us. And she chose him over us. So prior to 9-11, I would say probably earlier that year, my mom was married to this guy. He was an ex-alcoholic, but he became a gambler. So he had a gambling problem, and he gambled away the house without my mom knowing it. He took he took second mortgages and all this shit to pay for his gambling debts, right? George McShane, piece of shit. Plus, he was beating the shit out of my mother, too, which she didn't... If I would have known he was doing that, game on, motherfucker. Jesus. So then they get divorced. She's homeless. She finds out not only does they have nothing, not only do they have nothing, she owes money to the bank. She's in debt. I was doing good at the time. I had a construction business. I had a weed business. You know, I was delivering weed to fucking Dave Chappelle. I was delivering weed to... Um, Who's the guy that was the, the big actor? Harrison Ford. Wow. Like all these people. I had like this elite weed delivery service that de dealt with all the top models in the city. And like, that's how I met that model chick. And uh, so I had a lot of money saved up. So I said, Ma, you're not going to be homeless. I'm going to get you an apartment. I got her an apartment. I furnished it. I bought her TV. I gave her a bunch of money. So after the shit happens with my brother, I get this call and I'm dealing with this. And then she says, I, I calls me up. She's like, I want to tell you something. And she says, I don't want you to be mad. I was like, well, I can't say I'm not going to be mad until you tell me. What is it? She's like, I, I, I don't want to tell you. I was like, what do you mean you don't want to tell me? You just called me. She's like, I, I was lonely. I was like, and I say, and what? She goes. I let Carl move in with me. The dude who did not want me around moves in with my mom and sponges off of me. I'm paying the rent there. I was like, how the fuck could you betray me like this? I went the fuck. I said, everything I'm dealing with with Frank right now is because of you. All this shit is because of you. And you're going to do this shit to me? I fucking hate you. I started going off. She started, she started saying, stop, you, you know, crying. You don't, this is over the fucking phone, dude. You don't know the, the real story. I was like, I know the fucking story. I know my story. And she goes, yeah, but you don't know what really happened with your father. I was like, what? And she's crying. She's like, I, like sobbing. And she's like, I left your father after your bro older brother, Eugene. He broke in and raped me. That's how you were conceived. Everybody told me to not have you. I couldn't do that. 
He did it again, and that's how Frank was conceived. By the time I was 23, I had three children. No way to pay for them. He would break in and rob any money I had. He would pay the child support. I would cash the check. He would break in, beat the shit out of me, take all the money and any food I had in the refrigerator to feed you guys to give to his girlfriend's kids. And the doctors had me on amphetamines and barbiturates at the same time. I became suicidal. I spun out. And that's why you guys, the landlady found us in our underwear outside in the middle of the snow. She went inside. The apartment was filthy. We hadn't eaten the fucking roaches all over the fucking, I remember eating Chef Boyardee out of the fucking can. So now I, I just sat there fucking stunned. And we both broke down crying and said nothing for five minutes on the phone sobbing. And I never understood her story. Everybody has a story. That's why she was suicidal. That's why all the shit that, that you know, that she went through is because of what this maniac, alcoholic, ex-washed up prize fighter did to her. So everybody has a story, and we need to remember that. When we see people struggling, just like when I fed people at Tompkins Square Park, I told the story in the PMA effect, this 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 book. Mm -hmm. I said there was this one guy who used to come up and get food from us, and then he would go up and sit. So I just started sitting with him and being, you know, striking up conversations. I said, hey, man, you know, I do this because I was homeless, man. I know what led to me being homeless and all the rest of the shit. Didn't want to say nothing. I didn't push it. Next time I fed him, you know, hey, you know, how's it going, man? Like, you know, bringing up the shit. I'm like, what makes? So he, finally he says he's sitting there with me and he's quiet. And then he says, I was a Wall Street stockbroker making a quarter million dollars a year. I had the fucking condo down in, uh, Downtown, Tribeca, I had the summer home, I had a house upstate, we had the cars, I had two kids, the wife, everything was beautiful. They were killed by a drunk driver. I lost my family. I dealt with it by drinking. I started not going to work. I started doing drugs. I couldn't pay the rent. I lost my apartment. Nobody helped me. I didn't want any help. I didn't want anybody to tell me anything. I went and lived under the FDR drive in a homeless encampment. And then I was like, what the fuck? Like, don't judge people. We don't know the past and the suffering that these people, what they've been through, right? Mm. I stopped seeing the guy and I was like, fuck, man. I hope he didn't fucking you know, do something stupid. And then I see him and he fucking shows up. He's like, I want to help, sir. He was in a fucking suit. Clean. He's like, I want to pay it forward. You guys help me. I want to, I want to help feed the homeless today. He tells me I was going to jump off the Manhattan bridge. I was up there going to commit suicide. He said, my children, I had a I had this image, this shit came to me, like my kids. And we're like, don't do it. Like, this is, this is not going to make us happy. Don't do this. And he walked off the fucking bridge and went to a rehab. I talk about it in the book. Yeah. And I'm like, don't judge people. We don't know what they fucking went through that led to them being addicts. And that's what we always have to remember. It could happen to any of us. Mm -hmm. Anybody could become homeless. We're all one check, paycheck away, even now more than ever. Look at all the people that relapsed during the pandemic. Look at all the people that took to drugs and alcohol who never used drugs and alcohol. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, during the pandemic, it really kind of shifted a lot of people. I think some people I know during the pandemic got more successful. Some lost their business. Some people went to drugs and alcohol. Some people got incredibly, use it as an opportunity to get incredibly fit and healthy. And I think what you're 
what you were one one of the many lessons I'm taking from your story is that the importance of like empathy and the importance of seeing compassion. E yeah, compassion and empathy. Even people that you think are your enemies, realizing that they too are somewhere in their in their soul has like an innocence or a a victim a victim situation that they ha they can choose to take accountability for. They can choose to be disciplined and and recover the good parts of themselves. And I, I think that's a good leeway into like, I wanted to ask you about the state. Well, I just of, want to say yeah. one thing in that regard. Yeah, when sure. the pandemic hit, this was before 2021 and they had their so-called solution to everything, which I opted out of anyway. Um, um, everything was locked down mm -hmm. in New York City. There were no gyms. There was nothing. Okay. What did I do? I increased the meditation. I couldn't go in the pool. I biked all the way out to Rockaway Beach and went for a fucking swim. I cooked at home, made amazing meals. No restaurants were open. You had to go into every health food store with a fucking mask on and everything else. The point is, I finished two books. I wrote an album. And I fucking trained and completed an Ironman. Mm-hmm. At the end of 2020, I did Cozumel Ironman. Hell yeah. So, like, I used that time to sharpen my skills. Whereas, you know, some people under the pressure, which that's what Robert McKee says. True character is only revealed under pressure. The greater the pressure, the greater the revelation of true character. So, you know, I, I, I... Under that pressure, I said, this is what I need to do. I, I'm in recovery. I can't spin out and watch the news with this constant fucking case and deaths. And mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck all that shit. Yeah. I was like, fuck that. I'm not letting my mind get polluted by that shit. I don't want to know about it. I don't, I, you know, I got COVID because my girl worked in, what they termed a essential business, which was Trader Joe's. She handled the, um, she was the manager kind of the produce department. And so she got it. And then I got it. I was, I fasted. I did my oregano oil, my D3, all the shit, the zinc, everything I needed to do. I fasted. Then I got to, I beat it in three fucking days. So like I had it at the beginning of the whole COVID outbreak in New York but I dealt with it my way, right? right? So I said, I'm in recovery. I can't let this whole shit consume me and be consumed with all of this. Like, I got to take this and have a positive outcome out of it. And that's, you know, how we, we, we got our album out there now. Fucking, uh, I mean, we couldn't even get it printed because there was no printing presses open. Yeah. Like, even the books. I was like, I, every, I, I did the work and got it all done, but then there was no printing presses open. There were, they were not essential businesses. Nobody gives a fuck that you want to print an album or, or two books. I finished two books. I did my cookbook and I did Unfuck Your Health. Yeah. And I started a coaching business. And why did I start a coaching business? Because everybody needed it. Everybody needed some guidance at that point. And I was like, stay disciplined. That was my message to every one of my clients. That's my, that's the platform that I run off of is discipline. Yeah. I think so I, I just wanted to add that. And it's not to brag. It's just to show anybody could do it. Anybody yeah. could do anything if they apply themselves and, and stay disciplined and apply the, the knowledge and because I'm reading this book right here, which is great. If anybody wants to read a great book, the 12 week year. And one of the things that he said, so many people have bookshelves full of books. If they don't apply what's in those books, it's just useless knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's the application of the knowledge. That's the difference. There's a million self-help books, including the PMA effect. But What's going to be the game changer? The game changer is how many people apply what's in the PMA effect. Positive mental attitude, right? That comes from Napoleon Hill. 
So that's that's the whole difference. Is you can read so many books, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, any book on yoga, any any anything. If you don't apply the knowledge, it's basically useless. Yeah, I think uh, like we were talking about before, kind of connects to this a little bit. Like, everyone's predisposed to a certain situation, whether it's like your genetics or like you said, a certain gene perhaps or your situation or freaking COVID or like politics or whatever it might be. And some people choose to like to embrace it and make it make an, a, an identity out of it. And some people just choose to say, all right, well, this is the deck of cards I was given. I'm going to play the best freaking hand that I can. And I, I love that you are all about that. One of the things I was going to bring up is regarding sort of like the state of the world. It seems like you've been through so much crap and I didn't, you know, know how you were navigating the world then, but I'm, I'm witnessing and being a part of your social media expression of what's going on in the world today. And it seems like rightfully so you're, you're, you have a justifiable amount of concern and fear of what's going on right now. A, a, a brief background, like I grew up with grandparents, two of them escaped the Holocaust. And I know you could have gotten canceled for saying this a few years ago, but like, it's, it's just freaking true. I never understood when my grandparents would tell me stories about the Nazis. I never understood how an entire civilization, an entire country could just fold and just and let let this happen until COVID happened, until the past few years, until the political situation morphed. And you see people like turning on their neighbors and you see this crazy authoritarian shift in um, politics. And it, it's just it's something that really freaking scares me. And it's something I'm going to tell you a fucking story. Yeah, man. A friend of mine's mother took that shit and she had a fucking stroke. And she never recovered from it, and she passed. It's happening to a lot of fucking people. It happened to my brother Frank. It happened to so many people, right? So here's the thing that he said. His relatives were Holocaust survivors, right? And he said, when people started warning people of the Nazis in the late 30s into the early 40s before they went full fucking maniac, people were trying to warn people of what was happening and nobody listened. Nobody listened until it was fucking too late. Okay? They're running the same fucking playbook now. And the first thing they did was to say anybody that speaks out against what we're doing needs to be destroyed. And that's what they did. And as an intelligent person, I said, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to take in all sides of this. I'm also going to look at the history of these people that are running this narrative. What's their history? Well, their history is corruption, deception, paying people to lie, their corruption is lying to get us involved in wars where millions of people were innocently killed. Innocent people were killed, rather. Uh, all of this stuff. And I'm like, why should I? First of all, the first tenet of punk rock, which I started getting into in 77, was question authority. Mm -hmm. Right? Never trust the government. Never trust the politician. So why am I going to take what they're saying at face value? Why did they go 100% full bore into this whole fucking shit and never allow a debate from the people that I, and it's weird how I managed to stumble upon these people because Unfuck Your Health, the forward was done by Dr. Joel Kahn. Mm. Dr. Joel Kahn is the one who trained Dr. Peter McCullough to be a heart surgeon. Dr. Joel Kahn said, Look at, this is my, I made this guy a doctor. Look what he's saying in front of the Texas Senate, that they blocked the off-label therapeutics to get emergency use authorization. He was saving thousands of people in the University of Texas Hospital with a cocktail combination of different drugs, and they stopped them. So I, I don't want to get too far into it, because what's going to happen if we go down this rabbit hole is it's... YouTube is going to fucking uh, shadow ban this podcast because that's what the fuck they do. So all I'm saying is always look for every... There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term in writing. And my teacher, Robert McKee, 
uh, said, the thing we have to be very careful about in writing is to not be didactic, right? To not slant the story to make a point. He said, and as I say this, the uh, posters came up from Dr. Peter McCullough. <laughs> Fucking crazy. He said, you give, so there's two things in film. It's called the controlling idea and the counter idea, right? So, so the controlling idea is basically theme. What am I saying in my movie? And what I'm saying in the movie that I've been writing about my family situation and everything is that uh, we can only move forward in life when there's forgiveness. Right. That's that's really what that's what I learned the journey with my mother and everything else. I had to forgive. I even forgave Carl because it turned out that when he moved in with my mom, three months later, he told her he had stage four cancer and he was dying. And my mom cared for him until he had to be put in hospice. He came to my house. He said, I need to talk to John. My mother was like, I digested what she did. And I was like, okay, now that you told me everything, I get it. She's like, Carl would like to talk to you. This man was fucking six foot, like 220 pound fucking blue collar fucking. I mean, he fucking knocked my father out. That when my father, I mean, he was drinking my father, but my father was a professional boxer. He beat my mom up and Carl Got him and fucking knocked him out with one shot. He's like one of these big fucking like blue collar motherfuckers that could hurt people. When he showed up, he was already doing the chemo and everything. He showed up on my doorstep 140 pounds. I didn't even recognize him. He begged me with tears in his eyes. He said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you, man. It was I was selfish. You know, I don't know. He was like 150, like rail thin, dude. Like, you could just see death. He's like, I'm dying, but I have to clear my conscience. I don't care if you forgive me or not. I just want you to know that I'm sorry. And that man was sincere, and I forgave him. And I even helped his transition. When he was in hospice, I went up there. I put holy water from the Ganges. I put neck beads on him. I played a, a cassette tape of Prabhupada chanting, spiritual vibration the whole time so that he could transition peacefully to his next journey, right? So, you know, that's the whole, that's the whole thing in the nutshell is like, it's all about that, that fucking journey and forgiveness. And that's why um, the, the controlling idea of my film is, 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 is was all about forgiveness, right? That until we forgive, we're always going to have, basically, that's what I was saying. The value is forgiveness and moving forward, right? That's what happened at the climax of the film. So the counter idea to that is I am going to fucking destroy anybody that ever fucked with me. And I, have to, and I had to oscillate between those two values throughout the writing of the script. Robert McKee says, you give as much value to the controlling idea as the counter idea. That's not, that's how you are not didactic, right? Okay. So when I only saw one narrative and not the other narrative being allowed, the fucking red flags raised up. And we'll just leave it at that because I, I you know, I don't want to get too far into it. There's crazy shit happening now. And it's like, I don't have fear because what does fear mean? Forget everything and run. It's an acronym. Forget everything and run or face everything and rise. I'm a face everything and rise, motherfucker. I don't run from shit. I'm not in fear for this shit that they're doing. Everybody's arguing about motherfuckers on Bud Light cans and this and that and, and Trump and Biden and all this bullshit, and they're right behind the scenes, they're putting all the shit in place to enslave humanity on this fucking planet. The World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, they're putting all of the pieces in place to lock everybody down, to make this shit the prison planet. 
where they control everything. So everybody's attracted. It's like being lured in by the jewels on the head of a serpent, right? Oh, the razzle-dazzle. Oh, Trump, yay! Trump got fucking locked up. What the fuck is that doing for you? Biden, you know, they finally got Biden. There's tapes of him taking bribes. <clears throat> what the fuck is that doing for you? How? I tell people, focus on what you can fix. Start fucking getting ready because the shit is going to hit the fan. They're telling you the next one's coming. They said it. They're telling you the Restrict Act is coming. They're telling you CBDC, health passports, all this shit is coming. They're putting the infrastructure in place now. The New World Order always had this agenda. Now the technology is there to allow them to achieve it. And that's what's going on. So I don't have fear of it. I'm not fucking running. I'm not shutting up. They they took down my first Instagram page with 127,000 followers for speaking the truth. Everything I said is now turned out to be true. But yet they deleted the fuck out of my page. And they shadow banned me, and they still do. But it's coming to the end of this, because when the Restrict Act comes into place, you can't say shit. You're going to need a digital ID to go on a government website. They're going to run and control everything. That's what the Restrict Act is not about TikTok. That's bullshit. It's about silencing free speech and free thought in America and around the world. The last place where ideas can be exchanged freely. Right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to go into text messages, everything. Every time you accept the new policies on your iPhone, hidden in that whole shit was that they can look into your shit, what you're texting, what you're saying. It, as a matter of fact, France just passed the whole thing that now they can fucking go in and turn your camera on and listen to your conversations and film you without you even knowing. This is what's happening. But at the same time, there's a mass awakening. Yeah. of the masses and people are waking up so that's why they're doubling down on all this other shit and fast tracking it but see the one thing that they can't ever fuck with is consciousness that's how we're not going to fight them on a fucking material level you you show up with your fucking 20 ar-15s they'll send a fucking tank good luck that's not how you defeat them you defeat them here and here the battle will be waged spiritually, right? That's mm. even what Prabhupada said. That's how this will be won. Because what this is ushering in, it's always the darkest before the dawn. This is ushering in. They say it's ushering in the new world order. I say it's going to backfire on them and it's going to usher in the great awakening. It's going to usher in the golden period in the age of Kali Yuga that we're in, the age of Aquarius, all people waking up, the consciousness, people fucking coming together and uniting. You know, when I was a monk, we never once had a racial incident in the temple because we operated on the platform of Aham Brahmasmi. I'm not the body. I'm right. not black, white, woman, man, trans, all this shit. These are materialistic labels that people are putting. That's not who they are. The soul doesn't have any of those designations. So when you vibrate from that level and you act on that platform, where's the racism? Where's the sexism? Where's the homophobic shit? Where's any of that? It doesn't exist. Never once was there a racial issue in the temple because we, we didn't see color. We didn't see whatever. We knew there was gay people that were trying, you know, that were, 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 were like, everybody says gay sex, this sex, that sex. Hey, you know what? Prabhupada said any illicit sex is illicit sex. Doesn't matter who it's with. The guy who's running around banging broads and fucking, fucking making all these children he doesn't take care of. You think he's better than a gay person? He justifies in his mind, at least 
Well, at least I'm not uh, gay. Any illicit sex is sinful activity. And that sex is what it's supposed to be used for, which is the conception of, of a God-conscious child. You practice the uh, uh, the uh, Gavadam Samskara. You're chanting mantras. You're purifying yourself. You're attracting a particular type of soul to that womb, right? So it's like there's a whole science in the Vedas to even conceiving children, right? So it's like once you vibrate on the spiritual level and you get the real knowledge, that's what Veda means. Veda means knowledge, right? So when you get that knowledge, where is there a question of all of these fucking disgusting qualities that are existing right now, what you see going on? It's all distractions. It's all distractions distracting us away from who, who we really are. We're all the same on the spiritual platform. Nobody's better than anybody else. Everybody's equal. Yeah. It didn't matter what background you came from in the temple. You could be rich. You could be homeless. I was. There was people who were millionaires that joined the movement. What does it matter? So that's the whole, you know, there's a book, and I got it over here. It's called The Science. Let me see if this is it. It's called The Science of Self-Realization. And that's what Prabhupada said. It's about finding spiritual solutions to material problems. So these are some big material problems right now with these demons, and that's what they are. Prabhupada said there's 12 Rakshasha families of demons, and not demons like you see in the movies, like demoniac souls, who for many, many lifetimes have done insanely fucking fucked up shit. And they are controlling the entire planet. And look out, how can you do all this shit and start these wars and kill innocent children if you're, like, my writing teacher said Hitler believed everything he was doing was the right thing. Otherwise, he couldn't have acted. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You can't act. You have to believe that what you're doing is the right thing. These people, Bill Gates, all of them, Klaus Schwab, all of these, and then the ones we don't see behind the scenes, the banking, the, the fucking Rothschilds, all these fucking maniacs that have done this shit for years, they believe what they're doing is the right thing. Well, I mean, everyone everyone on some level probably thinks they have a higher level of moral superiority, right? That's like, that makes sense if 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 that's subjective for everyone. It, it feels like lately, lately meaning is a relative term, but it feels like in our modern world, like people are just trading one dogma for another. They're trading... This belief for, like, for that part, you know, political party becomes their new tribe, their new religion. And well, it's like well, people look are not at thinking. punk rock. Punk, punk yeah. rock was dogma for so many of these people. And the minute it was time to change the dogma, now the dog whistle is let's support the government and what they're doing. How the fuck did that happen? Mm -hmm. That just shows you that they didn't really believe in what they were saying. They were passing the time and just going along with the dogma of punk rock when they didn't have the essence of punk rock in their hearts and souls and actually practice it. Like I told people, I did not change. I'm not the one that changed. I stayed the same. You and the so-called scene changed and turned against those of us who spoke up. Yeah, 100%. So I didn't change. I've had the same fucking message for all of these years. You can list out my records going all the way back from Blood Clot in 81 and the Cro-Mags in the early 80s and all that. The message has been consistent. Same shit. And it's not just pointing out what's fucked up. It's offering a solution to it. On both worlds, what did I write? Spiritual flu. That's the real disease. That's the, that's the disease we need to deal with. I, can the I, spiritual can I, disease. I want to jump in because there's something I want to ask you about the topic of ego because you you have such a unique perspective based on being like a punk rock star, being on someone who also saw the other side of ego with the horrible violence and tragedy and terrible things in your life, the both sides of ego, and and I'm wondering if you have advice for people on how to not get too attached 
to what whatever your identity is, because I would I would imagine and I'm just guessing here. It could be completely off that when you're when you were in your music heyday, when you were at the peak of it, I could only imagine how freaking amazing that must have felt in some level. But then on the flip side, yeah. you had these horrible things happen and people listening. I think they're attached to the, the version of their ego that makes them better than everyone else, whether it's their politics, their career, their money, whatever it might right. be, or they're, or they're, they feel like I'm, I'm the worst fucking thing on the planet. There's both the double-edged sword of ego. And I'm wondering how you have been able to pivot and, and escape those different identities of your ego. Well, let me explain something to you right now. Ego is what destroyed the cro Okay. Ego is what destroyed the cro because when, when James Headfield from Metallica was coming to see us and getting in the mosh pit and Lemmy was saying, you know, out of every fucking band that we ever toured with, the only band I came out to watch every night was the cro because you never know what fucking insanity. Like we were the, we were the, we were the fucking it fucking band. Nobody. And, and we had the musicianship to back it up. But it started getting to individuals' heads. And then they started mistreating other members of the band, stealing money, doing all this shit. I stayed true. I had my problems. But I stayed true because everything that I took, including naming the album Age of Quarrel, came from Prabhupada's teachings. Kali Yuga. The Iron Age of Quarrel and Hypocrisy. The messaging to the lyrics. So you know how you stay free from it? You, it's, there's a Bengali verse. Chinada pisune chena, taroe vashi hishna, amani ramanadiyaya, kadani asadahari. You must always think of yourself in a humble state of mind. Lower than the stink of yourself, lower than the straw in the street. More tolerant than a tree. Devoid of all sense of false prestige. In that state of consciousness, one can constantly chant the holy names of the Lord, Hare Krishna, whatever, or stay on the path, right? So you got to keep the ego in check. I was seeing dudes in the bands start shitting all over fans when we started playing like Santa Monica Civic Center and all these big shows and treating the fans like shit that fucking made the band who we were. I'm not going to say... Who the fuck was doing it? Because next thing I know, I'll get served with more fucking papers. It's like every fucking thing. It's a fucking lawsuit with with one of these ex members. Like, you know, it's just ridiculous at this point. So I'm just saying, like, it was ego that destroyed the Chromags, right? Now, I mean, the real Chromags, you know, ended at the end of that. Uh, age of quarrel thing because I left then other members left then it was piecemeal this that I'm doing it this guy's doing it the only real true Chromex was the ones that played on age of quarrel that was the real Chromex Doug Holland Paris Harley me and and and, and Mackie and then you know Petey filled in on the tours whatever that was the real Chromex like and that's what took the band down. All the success, that's what tears down every band. Ego, look what happens. They all start out in a brotherhood. Oh, we're fucking in it to win it. We're fucking, you know, yay, it's all about the brotherhood. And then you start to see shit starts happening. Shit gets weird. They argue over girls. They argue over money. They argue over, like, who's getting more interviews. Like, it's just, it's crazy. When you live in a when you live in a particular space where it's like it's so easy for the ego to be out of control, whether you're in I know actors that blew the fuck up and I won't mention their names, but actually I will man I will fucking mention his name, Vin Diesel, right? Mm -hmm. When Vin Diesel started out, he was nobody. I know him since he did he did his first documentary film about him and his adopted brother. I knew him when he worked at fucking clubs in New York before he fucking took the juice. He was a little fucking skinny kid. Then he blows the, he, he goes to LA. We go out there to play. He's sleeping on the floor of our, our hotel, hitting on the girls in the backstage, drinking our beer. Like, you know, 
and then he blows up and he don't know nobody now. You see, it happens to everybody. You forget your roots and where you come from. My roots are in punk, hardcore, spirituality, even though whatever the fuck, who cares how famous I became? I still go out and fucking stand on the line and feed people at Tompkins Square Park. The real sign of somebody should be, you should use whatever notoriety you have as a way to do good things. When I raced this race right here, I raised $100,000 for a kid with cancer. Alexander Owens, suffering from cancer. I used my notoriety or whatever the fuck and benefits and all this shit, and we raised $100,000 for his family to help save their son's life. That's what you should be doing. You're famous? Good. Do something good about it. Don't go on this payroll of all these motherfuckers that did this in the last few years and, and you know, reiterating this government bullshit and fucking being a mouthpiece for the government, especially if you're fucking punk rock. Jello Biafra is fucking disgusting. Like the shit that this motherfucker has said and all the songs you wrote. How do you live with yourself? How do you sleep at night? Like I said, you know, I, I stay true. To, I, I, I stay true to the path. And, and uh, I didn't care what anybody else did. I didn't judge anybody. I just did what I did for myself. And in 2020, when I said, no, I will not be participating when them things come out in 2021, the whole world came after me, mm -hmm. that I was a selfish piece of shit. Fuck you. You're a fake. You talk Hare Krishna shit, and then you're fucking selfish. You, you know, you could kill some, all the shit, all the narratives that they were taught to teach, the Nazi narratives, they regurgitated that shit. And I called the main ones out. And Rolling Stone did hit pieces on me. Fucking NME in London did hit pieces. Metal Injection, all of them. Threw me under the fucking bus. Where the fuck are they now? Are they? Do they come back and interview me now that the evidence is coming out? No. Now they just move on to the next shit. Oh, you're talking bad against trans people? Like, whatever the fuck it is. Even with that, I don't have problems with... My friends who are trans, Mina Caputo, my friends that are gay and lesbian, they're like, what is this shit that they're doing? We never wanted to go fucking do shit in front of kids and do all that's my problem with it all as a survivor of sexual child abuse i know what these people are doing i see it and that's what i say you know why why is it that no one on the jeffrey epstein client list has been prosecuted not even one so what what's her name um Ghislaine Maxwell, she trafficked uh, children to nobody. You know, I know two, two of those children that got caught up in that and ended up on Epstein's Island from the ballet school in New York, right? Dig that. I saw what happened to them. Or how about the fact that 85,000 children came across the border unaccomp unaccomp unaccompanied by adults and are now missing? Right. This is the shit that I talk about because I got skin in the game man. I know what's happening. Like I, I, I like, you know, like I said, and that's my problem. And that's the problem with the with that's the problem of, of, of people like Mina Caputo and the rest of them, the singer of life and agony. She's trans, but she's not. She's speaking out against it and they're canceling her for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, leave the kids alone, man. Why the fuck you? That's the question you should be asking. Why does, why do, and how come it's always the men dressed as women that, that go trans, that want to be around, have the kids around? Why isn't it ever women who transition to men that want to do it? So my whole point is, I don't care what you do as consenting adults, gay, whatever, whatever you want to do, just do not. Bring it to fucking bring that shit to children. And that's what the main pushback is going to become. So you always have to look at the entire issue to always say, OK, this is what it's all about. No, it's not all about that. There's always 
every side to the story, right? And that's even when you go to court for something, what do they do? All right, let's hear the evidence from all sides. The prosecutor and the defense gets to argue the case. When it's only one side arguing the case, question it. I think just going against any mainstream narrative is very uh, hard for, for people. And I think that it's admirable. Whoever's listening that doesn't agree with you, does agree with you, it doesn't make a difference. It's it's admirable that there's a pattern in your life just from looking at it from the outside, looking in. That you have often chosen to do things that are incredibly hard or goes against the wind, goes against the, the friction because you believe it's the right thing. Yeah, you believe it's the right thing, right? And I think that is a bigger lesson that I that I think people could take from listening to your story. Like, if you believe something is the right thing, or if you just, hey, you just want to freaking question something. Like, what if you don't even know what the right thing is, but you just want to ask some questions? Why aren't I, we allowed to ask questions? That's what everybody should have been questioning. Why people aren't should question we allowed everything. to ask questions? People should qu- people should question everything, and uh, you know another big part of your I know things you've you've been uh, a big proponent of is being uh, I know you don't like labels, but being like living a vegan lifestyle, animal rights, I, things I, like I, that. I say plant. I mean, I am vegan. I don't wear leather, use animal products, yeah. whatever. I, I I just don't like their their mentality. Ninety percent of them are. That's another Talking great. Judgment. It's another yeah. great example of like doing something that's incredibly difficult. And I, I'm I'm I've been vegan since 2008, and I was vegetarian since like the early 90s so i'm in the similar camp and it's like it's gotten progressively easier but overall it's still difficult and and a strange path for most people and i think it's cool that you're not i've I've heard you say before you're not into labels that's so important because most people looking in if they don't know someone that's living a plant-based lifestyle they think we're all like freaking hippy dippy floating on lotus flowers and and it's some of us are Uh, well well, let me explain something to you what i eat doesn't make me who the fuck i am right it's just what you eat i don't i don't i don't live to eat i i eat to live it's just one part of our complexities in life, the diet that we choose. For me, I chose it for a certain reason, right? I saw people get, I, at 14 years old, I saw a dude get hacked to death in front of me. I saw motherfuckers get shot. I got shot. I got stabbed. I got beat down with baseball bats. I was abused as a fucking child. I saw what my father did to my mother. I came out of a world of violence. I didn't want to contribute to that. When I saw the 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 movie, um, the movie Meat, uh, by Frederick Weissman in 1980, I was like, holy fuck. No, and I was dealing with the Rastas. We didn't even call it vegan. It was called Ital, right? So one year later, I was fucking, I was Ital, plant-based. Now, here's the thing. When my book, Meat is for Pussies, came out, who canceled me? The vegans. The vegans canceled me. And Joe Rogan had me on his podcast. Who's a fucking carnivore? Yeah. Because he was like, let's open up the dialogue. I want to hear what this motherfucker has to say. And it was one of the best dialogues about the whole subject ever. And I say, the first thing I said in the book, if you eat this type of food, you will become a pussy dependent upon the pharmaceutical companies to keep you alive. If that's what you want, put the book back. It's not for you. Mm. And the conversation went from there. It was never meant to be judgment. Not, not judgment. I, I wasn't judging anybody. But the fact of the matter was, the ones who fucking, just like the ones who can't try to keep, tried to cancel me, I'm going to say, out of, this, out of this whole shit in the last few years has been the punk hardcore community. I gave my life to that shit. I'm a pioneer of the whole shit from 77. And then the birth of fucking hardcore. I've been there for it all. I gave more to hardcore and punk than any of them will in 10 lifetimes. I put that shit on the map along with these other people. I don't say I'm the gatekeeper, I'm not, but they're acting like they're the gatekeepers. Some 25 year old fucking nitwit is writing from his mommy's basement, fake shit about me, go fuck yourself. And I saw one of them on the street. I was like, he tried to walk by me. I said, nah, motherfucker. He goes, what? I go, you talk mad shit, motherfucker. Here I am. I said, say it to my face. That's what Mike Tyson said. All you motherfuckers have become comfortable with saying shit behind a computer or on one of these that would get you fucking knocked out. If See, I come from that world. 
I come from the up close and personal world. Before all this shit, you had something to say or you had a beef, you brought it to the person face to fucking face, mano a mano, and you fucking, you dealt with it. None of this cowardice shit, fake fucking profiles, right? fake pages, writing lies. And it's like the game telephone. The lie, then another lie, then that. Now it's like all this crazy shit. But I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck what they say. I don't give a fuck what the vegans say. Because they turn out to be hypocrites in this whole shit too. Mm -hmm. They lined up and bang, bang, bang. Animal products in it. Every animal in the test trial died. Oh, confront one of the big vegans. What does she tell me? Well, I never said I was the best vegan. Okay, so then shut the fuck up. How about that? Open up a can and shut the fuck up. <laughs> All of you, shut the fuck up. And it's like, I just take a stand for what, listen, that's just who I am. I came into this world fighting. I was conceived out of a rape. I was beaten. My mother was beaten while I was in the womb. You want to talk about a fucking, being, being a fucking fighter? I was conceived out of a fucking rape. Even before I left the womb, I was fighting for survival. You think your words are going to fucking cancel me now? And I always fall back on this. I always fall back on my chanting. I'm not, they think I'm this angry fucking, I'm like, bro, I have a beautiful fucking life. I have a three bedroom house in Florida. I have a fucking dog, a beautiful fucking fiance. Like I'm, I'm, I'm creating, I'm writing books. I'm writing a movie. I got a fucking, um, a TV show coming. I, I, I'm training for, you know, for my Ironmans and all this stuff. I was like, my life is fucking fantastic. Don't think because when I just post up about this shit that I'm sitting there miserable. I woke up before sunrise and, and meditated today. It's part of what I do, right? And it always has been. It's part of my DNA at this point, so to speak. Yeah. So it's like, we got to call bullshit. That's what, that's the main thing that you learn in New York City. And I said this yesterday. Growing up the way I did, the bullshit detector was always engaged. Mm -hmm. I read people. I fucking look, I, I, you know, it's just, that's the way, that's the way life is, man. You gotta, you gotta, at these, at this day and age, man, so many motherfuckers come with ulterior motives and, you know, very few are selfless in this world today. Well, I think part, I think part of being just an artist, a musician, an artist, a creator, part of it is is questioning everything and like not not only just looking for beauty and looking for new ways to create something out of nothing, but also ways to deconstruct things. Like I'm a I'm a visual artist primarily, and I I love breaking things apart and trying to understand how they work and how I can restructure them in a different way. And what if things were that way? What if things were that way? Question, and then also doing it to myself, like looking in the mirror and saying. What could I be doing better? What am I screwing up? How can I fix myself? You know, and constantly being on that path. Like I have my parents or my whole family's from Brooklyn. So I have like that similar kind of like no, no BS mentality. And, uh, I think having that with, uh, just being an artist, you, you, you view the world as different way. And I think it's, it's great to, uh, yeah. to, to challenge your beliefs. I, I think no one can challenge my beliefs more than I can. Right. So like, when I decided to become vegetarian at 16 or being, become a vegan or do any of the things, like I'm not judging anyone. 99.9% .9 of my friends yeah. eat meat. I have friends that are hunters. Like, Same thing here. And, and like, that's one of my, that's one of my personal being, you know, being plant-based and pro animal rights and blah, blah, blah. That's one of my strongest held beliefs. However, I can see this, the steel man argument against it. I could talk to hunters and all my meat eating friends and there's no problem. There's no, I, yeah. I can question what I believe. I can, I can see the flaws in my own stuff and that's how it should be. You shouldn't well, be that's like, how I look at one of the, like, you know, one of the best friendships I've developed in the last, since I did his podcast was with Joe Rogan. Right. People are like, how could you be that motherfucker's friend and all this shit? I'm like, dude, because my brother eats meat. Should I, should I, you know, should I fucking, 
shame my brother and tell my brother what a fucking scumbag he is because he eats meat. It's like that's your problem with these people. It's it there's no there's no middle ground for conversation. It's like it's either my way or fuck you. It's my way or the highway. Do what I say or I'm gonna cancel you. There's no room for like, you know, opposing views. And I said that the other day. I said, you know, when I first got into shit in, in 81 and I was living with the bad brains while they was doing that record and all that shit, I said we would sit around for hours, you know, debating and talking philosophy and Everybody was respectful to the other person's point of view. Now it's like, I'm going to shut you down. If you don't agree with what I, if you don't believe what I believe, I'm going to shut you down. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. Yeah. And what you just said was something important. Instead of the, the lens being out here, the lens needs to be fucking turned in on us. What have we got in our motherfucking hearts and our minds? How about fixing yourself, right? Yeah. Focus on what you could fix. That's my mantra now. And if you're pointing out all the faults of others all the time, that's some deep shit going on with you. Because here's the thing. If you read The Four Agreements, Don Miguel Ruiz, yeah, great what does he say? Don't take things personal because it's their poison that they're putting out into the world. They're letting you know where their consciousness is at. Somebody writes me yesterday at eight o'clock in the morning, I get a message talking fucking shit against my books and me and I'm a fraud and this and that. Eight o'clock, seven o'clock in the fucking morning. What's that person dealing with? When I wake up in the morning, I'm like, all right, let me say my mantras. I got, I have gratitude. I have another... Let me go out and see, read my emails, see who, you know, if somebody's reaching out on a daily basis for help in my social media or whatever, I send them links to shit. I'm like, okay, here's how you can get your blood pressure down. I'm looking to be out there and be of service to people. This motherfucker's writing me at seven o'clock in the morning. Imagine where that's coming from. Right. You have to have feel that bad for person, people like that, you know? That person's fucked up in their own hearts and minds. It's only if I accept what they're saying that it becomes a fact. And that's what Don Miguel Ruiz, anybody that, and I've recommended this book to a lot of people, including my clients, the four agreements, don't take things personal, always do your best, don't make assumptions, and um, be impeccable with your word. Four agreements seems very easy. When you start to apply them, that's where it separates the fucking posers from the real deal motherfuckers. Mm. And, um, you know, that's the whole thing is we need to focus on ourselves. Why we focus on our, that's what I tell people now. Get your shit in order because... You know, they let everybody out of the cages. They're running around touring and doing all this shit right now. But behind the scenes, they're working. They're fucking working. They got fucking shit coming. They got shit planned. And you better get your house in order. Because what, what would my that house look like, was man? in order. In 2020, what does that look like to, to get to get your shit in order? What is like what does that look like to you? People listening are going to be across the spectrum. Some people are going to completely be aligned with you. Some people think are going to think you're nuts or I'm nuts, whatever. And that's cool for you. N seeing the world as you see it, what is like being more prepared look like? First and foremost, clean and sober. Mm. Right. You have to approach shit with a clear consciousness. Right. You need all your faculties. You can't be getting fucked up and thinking like, next thing is you got to care. So, you know, some type of meditation, some type of higher power. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's going out and doing fucking cold immersion in a, in a mountain fucking stream. Whatever the fuck that is that brings you out of this and allows you to expand your mind and consciousness, do some of that. Maintain a good diet. Right. Look what happened. Over 85 percent of those that died from COVID were the obese with three or more pre-existing conditions. Where was the big health push? 
There wasn't one. Mm-hmm. So you need to get your um you need to get your house in order. And those are the three things that I I tell people, hey, and be informed. Don't listen to what's dribbling down the leg of some fucking politician or some fucking motherfucker on TV that's reading a script. Who gave them the scripts? BlackRock, Vanguard. They're all controlled. It's a controlled narrative. Break free from that. If you just listen to what's in your fucking heart and your mind, and the only way you can do that is being clean and sober, then you're going to question shit a little bit. You know, you're going to be like, I hope that for anything, after all this shit, the next shit that people are going to sit back for a minute and take inventory and say, all right, I'm hearing uh, the uh, controlling idea. What's the counter idea? Let me not be didactic. Let me let me look at the whole story, right? Let's see who does that. So it's not about going and listening to Alex Jones and you know all these people. You know they 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 nickname my bank full MAGA. Fucking I, Donald Trump. I spoke out against him for fucking years. All the shit that he was doing. I didn't vote for him. I didn't. I never voted in my damn life. Never. I never looked to politics to solve anything. Politics are trying to make the prison a nice place. The goal is to get out of the prison. And look at the guards. They're all taking payoffs. The warden's corrupt. That's the prison we're living in. And people create mental and physical prisons for themselves. John, so, John, let me ask. Let me ask you this: What would what would that what does that look like? Like, you know, like a lot of the people that you're talking uh, that are, a, let's say, the in opposition of a lot of the stuff you say, are are in a place where they're almost like they want this like utopian magical world, right? And like, I wonder what that like what a quote like utopian world would look like for you. Let's say in the future, five years, a thousand years. What would society or the government or the world look like and how would it function if things pushed in a direction closer to what you think is more ideal for us as humans? Well, let's look at my situation. Why did I move out of New York? I wanted to be I live in a spiritual community down here. I'm getting into organic farming. I want to become self-sustained solar power. I live near all the underground uh springs where these water companies are getting their water from blue springs jenny springs post springs so i got you know and and i'm living a more spiritual life right now like i wake up in a beautiful area of the country and 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 uh you know that that's to me Prabhupada said what the answer was simple living and high thinking that's the answer That's the answer. Live simply. You don't need all this shit like that. Everybody puts so much emphasis on. I have to have all this stuff, this, that, the other thing. Like, you know, what it looks like to me is, is like I said, what I do when I wake up in the morning, like uh, uh, it's, it's example is better than precept. Prabhupada said that also. What's the, it's not what a motherfucker says. It's what they do. It's how they live. That's the key to the whole thing. So that's what it looks like to me, you know? And uh, I'm just like, we don't have that much time on this planet. Like, we think we have all this time. Like, time is fucking, what does it say in the Bhagavad Gita? Time I am the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer, when he set off the first atomic bomb, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita. That was the quote from the Gita that he chose. Time is destroying every one of us. We're getting older. What are you going to utilize your time for? Don't waste the human form of life. The animal eats, sleeps, mates, and defends. If that's all we do in this world, then we're polished animals. The human has the ability to ponder the existence of what you of what we're supposed to be. What is life about? Look at all the great philosophers over the over the year, thousands of years who 
sat around talking about life. Who does that now? All they talk about is what the latest gossip bullshit is. And you know what Prabhupada said about that? It's simply the croaking of the frogs, letting the snakes know where they are so they could come and devour them. Prajalpa in Sanskrit means nonsense talk. That's what it is. And we're all arguing with each other. We're all fighting each other. And it's exactly the way they want it. Because when we're fighting each other and not coming together, it allows them to be in control. Democrats and Republicans alike, they're all fucking crooks. They just gave themselves like $70,000 raises and shit while we're going fucking broke. Yeah. They're finding out all this money now and we're sending to Ukraine whatever, $200 billion. They've been stealing it. Politicians, look what they did. Who's that kid with the fucking afro, the white kid? He had the crypto thing. Uh, so, David, David yeah, yeah. something? That guy, I what forgot, was it? I forgot his name. Isn't it like David uh, Freeman or, or something Freeman, that guy? Sam, Sam whatever, Freeman. But yeah, so, so let's look at that. Yeah, yeah. That was bigger than the Enron scandal. Where did, it, where did that story go? It fucking disappeared. Yeah. Because what happened was we were giving billions and hundreds and millions to Ukraine. Ukraine turned around and invested in his crypto company. He took that money and gave it to political campaigns. Money laundering 101. And now all 12 people from the Ukraine, including the Minister of Defense, had to step down and get fired because they stole tens and millions of dollars. So listen, the more we fight, the more control they get. And that's why I look for solutions and not just like constantly, you need to make people aware of what's going on. That's why I tell people, hey, you eat this fucking GMO food, including the impossible shit and all the rest of it, you're going to get fucked up, dude. I'm trying to like warn people, you know, if, if there's a thief that comes in the room and I don't warn my friend to hide their backpack or, or, you know, tell my friend to, yo, watch your purse. Am I your friend? A friend warns that person, hey, this guy's a fucking thief. Like, you know, watch your shit. So yeah. that's what, you know, we need to warn people, but it's up to them. It's up to them. Like, it's called mass formation psychosis. How did everybody, they know they, they, they ran with the Nazi playbook. The Nazis didn't go away. Everybody thinks that. They didn't. Look at fucking what Soros was doing. He was going around confiscating and turning on his own people. Look at what fucking Klaus Schwab's father made fucking shit for the Nazis. They got a fucking uh, a certificate from the Nazis. Now this motherfucker's talking about you will own nothing and be happy. We must take control. We infiltrate the cabinets. And you're listening to this guy. People are going to like think uh, some people are going to think that this is all crazy. But if like if you look at history, like we were just in we were just in Europe with our kids and uh, we got back from Amsterdam. We watched uh, a, a documentary about Anne Frank with my children. And you, you, you can look at documentaries, you can read books, and it's like, what happened first? They had registries of their enemies. They collect, They gathered their enemies. They took their guns okay, away. Okay, we they need to know who took got their in, rights who away. They, they made lists of who's where, and, and then they had them turn on their on their neighbors and their family. And like, I'm not, you, I'm not being a conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying, just read history and make your own, make your own judgments. You, you know, do, if you fail to remember history, you're doomed to repeat it. Look what the Stasi did in East Germany. Did you ever see that movie? I think it won an Academy award about the fucking, uh, the Stasi in East Germany and how the guy was spying on this family's conversation. And he started to actually have empathy for the fan, but dude, they've done this all before. It's the same shit. They're doing it again. And now it's like they can just get you on all this stuff. And then, like, if, if they digitalize currency and all the rest of the shit, it's a wrap. Because all they got to do is hit that switch. Boom. Nope. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. Cashless society. Up. Oh, China. They're all praising China. Communists. 
that fucking kill. Uh, they put uh, Muslims in these fucking prisons and kill them and harvest their organs and fucking horrible, mm -hmm. horrible fucking record of human rights violations. It, it's it Where really did Joe it, Biden ever criticized China. It's really concerning to me how cannibalistic society has become. We're like we're like eating ourselves, and like people are so quick to label each other. Like you you say one thing, and they say, "Oh, you're you're an alt right person." You say another thing, "Oh, you're a leftist person." It's like why can't you just be like floating in the middle, have your own independent That's what thought? I am. Like why you do you have what? to? Like, I love yeah. what like, you know what Chris Rock said in one of his specials. He's like, I'm not any political. I, he said, I'm I'm conservative on some issues and I'm liberal and on other issues. I look at the issue. I don't give a fuck about a political party. Same, same. And that's exactly what it is. If if a fucking if a left wing uh, liberal says, hey, tearing down the rainforest and all this shit to graze cattle, we're destroying the environment. Guess what? You really are. So if a, if a fucking conservative says. We should not be sexualizing and putting sexual material in the schools for children. Right the fuck on. You see what that is? That's called looking at the issue. And look at how many people turned a blind eye to what Trump did or what Biden did or whatever because they didn't want to fucking ruffle the feathers of the party. So they let him get away with it. Right? So that's my point. Like, I don't give a fuck about any politics. I never voted in my life. I called out every fucking president. My track record speaks for it. Look at my books. Look at my albums. Look at my interviews. Everything all the way up to fucking 2023. I think it's just important to just be more loving, spiritual person, have empathy. Really, you know, I, I, have, right. I have friends on all across the spectrum of politics, and, and I— I have no problem with that. That's how it should freaking be. But well, I think that's, people that's, are people are so quick to to put things into digestible little chunks that, you know, whether well, it's that's like what they do. And when they can pigeonhole you into a group. Right. Like all of a sudden, the lie is I'm a right wing Trump supporting conspiracy theorist, racist, misogynist, uh, fucking homophobic, transphobic person. That's a piece of shit. That's what these people write about me online. Right. Because then. They don't have to accept the fact that maybe they're wrong, right? I don't, like, I, I look to the commonality of people. I want to get along with people. I want to be, unless you're an evil motherfucker. You touch a fucking kid into the fucking, you know, you get dealt with. Like, there's certain motherfuckers I don't give a fuck. You do that shit, it's on. Yeah. But what I'm saying is politics divide. Consciousness brings people together. So let's decrease the political. Now they're amping it all up again. Oh, it's going to be this guy against that guy. And oh, my God. And like, you know, it's a fucking joke at this point. I laugh. I'm like, holy shit. How many times are you going to? What's the definition of insanity to keep doing the same things and expecting a different result? Like they're doing the same shit. They're triggering all of you motherfuckers through these fucking corrupt career criminals, whether it's Obama or Nancy Pelosi or fucking Trump or a fucking Mitch McConnell, any one of these motherfuckers. They're all corrupt. Like, I had fucking vegan uh, telling me, like, that support Trump. I'm like, Trump has a steak company. I had Harry Christians telling me, yeah, Trump. I was like, Trump owns a steak company. How is he a fucking savior of humanity? Look at all the shit he's done. You're That's some clown shit, dude. None of those people are out for your best interests. None of them. They're out for themselves. Okay? Like... Donald Trump talked about fucking letting people in the country and all this. Guess who works at all his hotels when he could save that money and burn the unions in New York and hire fucking scabs? What do you think he did? You think he was like, no, American made. Even the Donald Trump hats weren't made in America. Make America great. Made in China. Fucking <laughs> I don't know dude. what the uh, I don't know what the solution is because we have a system where it's structured in this way. So you you kind of have to uh, 
Unless you just the solution yeah. is all of this shit is gonna burn and crash and fucking burn. This is all every empire falls, and this is going to be the fall of the Western. The you know we had the the movie the decline of the Western civilization. Did you see that documentary? No, no. Now we have the fucking fall of the Western civilization. The fall is coming, dude. You're seeing it now. This shit is over with. They're all dumping the U.S. currency, all of this shit that's going on. This is all, yo, no empire lasts forever, dude. And we're seeing the, the fall of the fucking, but there's so many amazing people in this country and other countries around the world that just want to live free. We just want to live free. We want to just fucking live our life the way we see fit, you know? Yeah. And and why does somebody have to, you know, why do they want people in 15-minute cities eating bugs? You'll own nothing. We're going to control all this shit, the 2030 fucking agenda that the UN has and all this. Fuck you. I didn't, you don't have control over my life. Fuck you. You're telling me I got to take your shit? Fuck you. I'm not taking nothing. You got some motherfucker with McDonald's Telling me I need to take something to protect their health? Fuck you. That's what I got to say. And it's a, we have to start coming together. Otherwise, I, 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 at this point, it's like the dam is breaking anyway. And like I said, it's the darkest before the dawn. And this is a golden era in, in the Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga is 437 or whatever years. But there's a 10,000 year period within the Kali Yuga of enlightenment. We're only 500 years into that. The Renaissance, all this shit that happened started five, over 500 years ago. So now in order for humanity to become spiritually awake, this shit has to be destroyed. And there was a famous story of how this Brahmin let all the demons fight and kill themselves. And then the Brahmins came in and, and created a, a godless society, a God, uh, a God, sorry, God centered society or spiritual society based on truth. Everything now is based on lies, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why there's so much turmoil. You know, which lie did I tell? Like that book, you know, what's great about the truth. You don't have to ever remember what you said. You just stick with the truth. Here's the truth. There's no stories. Well, what story did I tell there? That's the thing about when you tell the truth. You don't have to go back and be like, well, what did I say about that? Because you just repeat the truth. And that's what I do. And that's why these the teachings of Prabhupada, you know, comes into play. Because I'm reading a Bhagavatam that was written down 5,000 years ago, and I'm like, they're describing the symptoms of Kali Yuga? It's everything that's happening now. The great sages had wisdom, right? That's the way we accept knowledge. Guru, Sadhu, and Sastra, right? Sastra is the teachings. The, the, the guru is the spiritual teacher. And the, and the sadhus are the enlightened uh, people, right, that are giving us the knowledge. So I'm not listening to Joe Schmo on ABC Evening News. I'm like, okay, well, what do the sages say about what's happening? And that's my point of reference. And I act out from there. What did this, what's the advice that the sages are giving how to counteract the effects of Kali Yuga? That's the answers that we need to be searching for. But nobody's searching for them. They're all arguing on the superficial materialistic level. And that's where all the hate and everything else comes from. But turn that camera inside, man. Every one of us, do the work on yourself. Do the work on yourself. That's been my, you know, that's been my whole thing is this has been a lifelong journey of me doing the work on myself. You know? Mm-hmm. What would you say, the last thing I want to ask you is, what, what would you say over, over the period of, let's say, the past five, ten years has been the biggest 
change for you as far as how you view the world, how you uh, live your life? Has there been a major, major shift? Because it seems like there's been milestones in your life and, and certain pivot points and exit ramps that you've had. What would you say is like the most recent big you know, exit marker that you went off the ramp on and, and switched how you view life or your, you know, how you view the world? Preparedness. Because if anything showed me from 9-11 through this pandemic is how shit could switch on a dime. How fast things can change. Mm. Right? So where's the preparedness? You stay prepared in your life so that when the shit goes down, you're ready for it as much as you can be. I mean, we don't know what's coming next, but they're telling us, oh, there's going to be another thing. Oh, I could, Russia could easily bring a suitcase nuke into New York City, Joe Biden's telling us. There could be, the power grid could shut down. There could be a cyber, there could be the cyber attack. Fucking Klaus Schwab. So, stay prepared, man. Don't get caught out there. Mm. What do I say in my book, Mean for Pussies? If we fail to prepare, we're preparing to fail. You know why everybody crumbled? 99% of the people during COVID? When they injected fear was because they were unprepared mentally, physically, and spiritually. So what are they going to do? They're going to give in to the fear mongering. I didn't. I went about my business. And I obviously had to adjust because everything was shut down. But it it, it made me see, okay, uh, I got to be even more prepared. And I saw what happened in New York City. Motherfuckers was brawling in the streets over a roll of toilet paper. Lines down the block to get into a health food store or any store. The shelves empty. It's very easy. It is a very fragile society that we live in. COVID proved it and 9-11 proved it. What's next? What did Bill Gates say? This next one's really going to get their attention. A lot of people didn't take this one serious. Right? Yeah. What does that mean? What the fuck does that mean? And then him and his wife look at the camera and smile. You don't believe me? Go find the interview. You think I'm bullshitting? You think I'm making up conspiracy theories? They're telling us, Joe Biden, we're definitely going to have another pandemic. It's going to be way worse than the last one. Oh, how the fuck do you know that? Anyway, but let's, you know, I, I, I say start getting your fucking ship in order now, man. Get prepared to go underway, like they say, you know, in the military, haze gray and underway. Before you even deploy your fucking ship, everything, man, like, you have to get every, you know, that's one thing I learned in the military. It's like, be prepared, man. Prepare yourself. Get yourself straight now. Learn how to, that's why I willingly put myself in precious situations. If you don't train and practice, what are you going to do in game day? I have a friend who did 20 years in the SEALs, a team leader and everything. They put those motherfuckers through every fucking thing you could possibly imagine. Why? Because one day they're going to be out there and they don't have anybody when they're behind enemy lines. What is it? I don't know how many people in, in, a, in a squad, 12 people or whatever. They got to count on the guy on the left and the right of them to get them back to their fucking families. So that's why they put them through hell. There's no, like, tapping out, I quit. That's it. So I, I you know, I, I really feel if you don't have those qualities, then place yourself around motherfuckers that do. Because just like placing yourself around a fucking drug addict is going to make you to do drugs, I personally try to 
stay around. And I wrote that in the PMA effect. Men and women who are fucking hard charges that get shit done under any and all circumstances. Because those qualities will rub off on us. Those good qualities. And spiritually minded people. I'm, I'm trying to be around them. Watch who you let in your camp. You know how many people I thought were my friend? Like, telling motherfuckers, yo, I love you, man, fucking all this shit. And then when this all shit just went down in the last few years because I had a difference of opinion, you know how many of those motherfuckers won't even talk to me anymore? And even after they've been proven to be wrong, they still, their ego, the false ego won't allow them to fucking... I did have a couple of people say, hey, man, I got it wrong, this and that, whatever. I was like, I don't judge you for that. Like, you know, I've gotten shit wrong, too, and corrected and had to go back and eat some humble fucking pie. But now it's like nobody wants to do that. So that's all I'm saying is watch who's in your camp. You know, get your squad together now, man. You know? Yeah. I, I I'm would... down here. I'm down here getting everything in order, raised bed gardens and finding a fucking piece of land and taking care of all the other shit I need to take care of. Yeah, I would add that uh, I think your camp, as you described, but I think uh, the internal parts of your camp are really important, too. We all have these different sides of our persona that are conflicting and not agreeing with each other and like getting your getting your mind in order with the different sides of your personas is a really important part of that as well, which I know you agree it's with. It's like one of the main parts, as a matter of fact. I'm glad you, that you brought that up because, you know, writing, when you write for a character, what is Robert, what does my teacher tell you to do? You write from the inside out. You get in the side of that character from their perspective and, and, and no two characters have that same perspective. That's how people, when they write flat dialogue, it's like, you're writing from your perspective. Uh-uh, you got to get inside that character and you write from the inside out. We need to act from the inside out, right? We need to get our internal shit straight so we know where the fuck we're going. You know, we know, and we act on that platform. The, we make decisions on that platform, not on like I'm triggered by some shit somebody said or I'm in fear because the news is telling me this. You know, according to the news, when it first came, you know, half the country uh, was going to die, you know. And I'm going to the hospitals filming it because my friends worked there and they was never overcrowded like they're telling you. So. That's all I'm saying. All right. Man. And I, that, that's a good point. Get your mind right. Get your soul right. Get your fucking everything right. Your physical, mental, spiritual. It all has to come in a, in a line. I, I, Operate from that platform. The way I like to view stuff, you know, like I said, I'm a visual artist. So I always think of it in terms of that. And I think people should it's good advice to look at life as though it's a blank canvas and you can compose it however you want you can put the details wherever you want you could ignore the spots because you know what like in a painting or in a song like the negative space and the empty parts are almost just as important as the parts that have that have pigment or have a baseline on it like it's important with that it's also important to focus on what the subject matter of your canvas or your life is and I think that that those are those are important lessons to uh, to take from all this. You you have to take authority to create the kind of life that you want, present the image or the music or the life that you want to present to people and contribute in a way that that has an impact on people. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, that's what it's all about. It's it's even in writing, it's always about the subtext. It's the unspoken truth. It's what it's what's not being said, right? That's the power of the scene. I wrote the song Subtext in Blood Clot on uh, Burn Babylon Burn, and that's what that song was all about. Unconscious truths behind the lies, right? It's always the unconscious truths that are there. And it's not, it's the lies we tell ourselves too. Yeah. Uh, the, sub, the power of the moment is in the subtext. Right. It's it's like that in writing. It's it's always what the character isn't saying. When you go to the psychiatrist and you're just telling them all this shit, 
or her, what is it they're writing down? What you're not saying. They're understanding what you're not saying is where the issues are. Yeah. The text and the subtext are two different things. You know, just like characterization versus true character. Characterization is the observable qualities. Oh, that's a tattooed, strong dude, fucking blah, 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 blah. And then when the pressure comes on, characterization falls away, the mask falls away, and then the true character emerges. And that's how, that's what life is about. Yeah, and, and it should be interesting, uh, and it should, know, it should have conflict. It should be a little crazy. It should make you think. It should make you question stuff. Like good, right. good, good art, good music, good writing should welcome be those the, things. Welcome the conflict. Yeah. What happens in a film when the conflict dies on screen? The attention, the the audience loses the intention and the focus. They start checking their text messages and everything else. Yeah. When you have a tremendously powerful scene full of conflict, everybody's fucking like, "What's going to happen?" So people try to avoid conflict. I don't. I welcome it. Like I welcome challenges. That's why I still do Iron Man. I welcome the fucking challenge. The 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 that's the discipline that it takes to get up every day, work, you know, meditate, work on my writing, train for the Iron Man, coach people, do the music, all this shit. Right? Yeah. What is my day filled with? Negative shit or positive shit? That's why I don't even let that shit affect me, man. I'm on fucking cloud nine and some fucking Mama Luke wants to write, you know, you're a fraud or whatever the fuck you, you know, like rumors that I heard about you. Like, you know, give me a fucking break, man. It's, you know, you, 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 uh, you gotta stop. Yeah. You know, you gotta stop putting so much, uh, care into what other people are saying. And that's the reason with the cancel culture that everybody stayed quiet. Nobody wanted to rub up. Oh man, they're going to talk bad about me. And then my band's not going to be able to play any shows and I can't sell t-shirts or whatever the fuck it was. So many people wrote me and were like, yo man, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm like, well, why don't you open your fucking mouth then? Why don't you fucking say something? That's why they're getting away with it. That's why the Nazis got away with it. This is Nazi fucking 2.0, what they're doing right now. People just don't see what's coming. They want to stick their head in the sand. You know? Oh, I'm going to play my festival. And Fucking crazy, man. Oh, well, people they want to uh they want to have an enemy. I think there's a human need to have a hero and a villain and people are very quick to apply those labels and it's it's crazy, but you know, people you know, I'm an artist. I'm I, I definitely am admitting I had certain I I have some of that where it's like I have to sell art, I have to do my business, I have kids. People do yeah. have a justifiable, understandable reason to be concerned, but I, I hear what you're saying. It's yeah, no, I understand that, and it sucks that that's the way that it is, And but I understand that, too, because, like, it's the same reason that people were forced to comply. They were like, well, they're going to take my job. I got to pay my rent and fucking... It should have never come to that, though. Right. It should have never come to where I have to shut the fuck up, otherwise I'm going to get canceled and, and I can't sell my books or my albums or my art or whatever. Why did it even come to that? That's what we should be asking ourselves. How did we allow them to get that type of control so easily? Right. That's the thing that shocked me the most about people that I thought would have definitely stood up, folded like fucking Kmart suits. Yeah. That's the thing that I'm like, wow. And I just went about business as normal. You know, I, I increased my meditation, increased my my training increased my compassion to other people i had people writing me all through the pandemic fucking like hey man like what can i do to meditate how can i eat better i was fucking i did courses for free i had a hundred people i taught the discipline kickstarter course for free i had a hundred people come on for free two hours no charge mm -hmm. you know? and, and 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 that's the last thing i want to say is Anybody that wants to have a, a nice 
an open perspective and, and really search to the knowledge for the answers. I'm gonna give I'm gonna email you the link to get any of, of Prabhupada's uh, you know books, which the Vedas are thousands and thousands of years old. He translated more books than anybody, word for word, and he added the purports. And he's actually in Harvard and all the universities in the philosophy department. He's in the Guinness World Book of Records for translating more books than anybody in history. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to check out and, and read the books, you can read them digitally, you can order them, or you can listen to them uh, on, on audio for free. There's no charge. Somebody's giving you something for free. And that's what Prabhupada said. Just see, we are giving away the mantras, the food, the philosophy for free. And no one is coming. But some cheetah guru is over here charging you money for a mantra and charging you money to go to a yoga class, and it's filled up. Yeah. Well, I mean, marketing is a magical thing. You know, it's like it make marketing makes a difference between which music and art people see and hear and which they don't. And it's 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 super unfortunate. And it's you know, as, as someone who's like a solopreneur, I'm doing everything myself. Like I'm trying my best to get my art out there. It's like you're saying, like. The marketing it, it matters, and uh, they'll yeah, well, listen look to what it. they're doing now. How they're controlling everything. Richard Dreyfuss just spoke out against this new shit. All this shit that you have to have in order to be nominated right. for a fucking everything's going woke. Even the albums, you have to be singing about this or that, or we're not going to push your album. What is this bullshit? What is this bullshit? Yeah, it's bullshit. But the company's BlackRock, I just saw him come on and give an interview, the, the CEO of BlackRock, and say, oh, no, we're going to manipulate how things are done, and we want certain things pushed. And if they don't push it, then we're going to fucking make them do it. So they're pushing all of this shit. Step the fuck back. Be punk rock. Say, fuck you. Go out on your fucking shield, not on your fucking knees, man. Yeah, man. John. Because I got news for all you cancer culture motherfuckers that might have heard this. The monster's coming for you next. You think. That's what the Nazis did to all the collaborators. Guess what? They got fucking whacked, too. And that's what's, hap what's going to happen. These people are friends with no one. There's a very, like George Carlin said, it's an elite club and you ain't in it. So when you think these are your people and you chose them off the people in your scene or your family or your job or your fucking, your movie set or whatever, you sided with the fucking devil. And we can leave it at that. John, dude, thank you so much for dude, taking so much time to chat about these important topics. It was yeah, good to us. Well, uh... it's important. It's important. Yep. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam. Hearing is the first step of the awakening, right? We heard about punk rock. We heard about this. It's Sound vibration is the most powerful thing in this material world. That's why they look to control it. They look to see... They want control of the narrative because sound has the ability and the spoken word has the ability to change minds and hearts. Mm, it's beautiful, man. And if you want to have some thought and, and provoking dialect and all this stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to email you this link. I would appreciate if you could post it up. Definitely. My, uh, on Twitter, I'm JJ Cromag. John Joseph Discipline on Instagram. John Joseph on Facebook. Um, JohnJosephDiscipline.com is is my uh, website. My coaching services, books, whatever, whatever the fuck. Yeah. Uh, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. John Joseph. The Hard Truth with John Joseph. It's all about cooking and recipes and philosophy and health and wellness. So so check it out, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna include all, all your links, all your info. Oh and, man, and, uh, cool, bro. People, you know, people listening, like if 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 John's dialogue uh, rubbed you the wrong way, I just say that's good. It's good to get challenged. And if John, what John is saying is is aligned with you, that's cool too. It's it's all good. You can you can hear this but, but, and be. But, but, get, but, you know, but here's the thing: I want people to be like 
questioning it and yeah, not being of like, oh, John Joseph from the Cro-Mags or Blood Cloud or whatever the fuck, Iron Man, I'm going to listen to what he says. No. That's, don't take everything you hear, you should challenge. 100%, that's my, man. That's my fucking challenge to anyone. 100%. Everything you hear, challenge it. Don't I mean, accept yeah, it at dude. face value. I do that with, I think everyone should do that with themselves. Every day I wake up, I challenge my own beliefs. I said yesterday or the rest of the past 10 years, I believed in X, Y, Z. Do I still believe it? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Always, always yeah. question your, your beliefs and, and whoever you hear as well. Don't, you know, one of the, I, I teach 10, uh, 10 principles of discipline. And one of them is self-assessment mm. that we need to go back in order to understand how far we've come. There needs to be a gauging system. We need to self we need to self-assess. Where am I? Am I moving forward? Am I stuck in neutral? Am I going in reverse? Yeah. Self-assessment is is a very important part of the discipline. In process. Absolutely, brother. On that so, note, on that note, right. we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, good good chat. It's, it's a great place I'll to end off. Think so you can you can post it up and all that, dude. Thank you, brother. It's been great to uh, connect it, with man. you in good person. Good talking man. to you, bro. Hey, where, I see you I, got I, your I your, Chris, I, your salt your salt light back there, man. Oh yeah, man. I forgot to even ask you what part of Florida are you in? In North Florida, I live by like? Gainesville. Okay, I I used to live it's a in big uh, farming community over here. We, for a few years, farms. we lived in uh, St. Augustine and Atlantic Beach for a little while. Oh, I know St. Augustine. Yeah, that's nice over there. Yeah, that was a great. That's work. about two hours from me on the coast. Yeah, you said uh, like Jenny. Jenny's... Jacksonville's about an hour, and yeah. then. You, you said Jenny Springs. I'm like, you must be in North Florida because no one else knows about yeah, that. Yeah, Jenny Springs, Poe Springs, uh, Blue Springs. Yeah. I love it, man. I just get out on my bike over here and go for fucking miles and miles. Great spot, man. I mean, sometimes I don't, I don't see cars forever. I'm yeah. like chanting to the cows. They're going to kill you. Hare <laughs> It's a great you're spot, man. Grass, but you don't know what's coming. <laughs> I mean, the, te the temperature's mild. You're, you're so close to New York and, you know, that area to get back whenever you want. It's, yeah, like, it's a great spot. I'm coming up to New York this week. It's yeah. fucking two hours and I'm home, man. And, and like, this is my home base, but New York's always like my home home. I go sure. up there. I, I'm working on a one-man show right now that's going to be dropping in the fall, a spoken word thing. Cool. Uh, based on my book, Evolution of a Cro-Magnon, all the stories about New York and people and all that shit. And uh, I'm still doing, I do the walking tour thing and my band, part of my band's up there. And so like, I got yeah. family there. I'm there all the time, but awesome, man. this is my sanctuary. There's nothing for me to do here, but wake up, meditate, eat good, get on my computer, write what I got to write, go out and train. It's perfect, There's no bro. distractions. There's no like, I'm going to walk to Tompkins Square Park and then you meet people and it's like three hours later. Yeah. Holy fuck, I could have been writing. Wow. There's none of that here. That's why, you know. Yeah, man. We live in, uh, we we're we're an hour south of Manhattan. We live in uh, New Jersey on the beach. So if you, uh, hopefully we'll, what, what we'll link up in person. We're uh, closest to Spring Lake Beach, like south of Asbury oh, yeah. Park, like maybe 10 minutes from Asbury Park, Stone Pony. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, really close right. to that. Good right. stuff, man. Dude, have an awesome day, brother. You too, bro. All right, man. All Peace. The best. Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast also if you guys can follow us on social media we would love to hear from you we are on pretty much every social media platform at shifting perceptions podcast which is the same as our website shifting perceptions podcast.com we look and reply to all comments so please share with your friends tag us we appreciate all the love and don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments. So I'm sure if you want to just have a space, you can reach out. These are the places to do it. Um, we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.